Let's take our Bible and let's go to Psalms. We're on the series on the names of Jesus Christ. The names of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name, that name Jesus. And these things that we're talking about that connect to the name of Jesus Christ are things that describe attributes about that name. Now, last week we were talking about the bread of life, and I did not finish the scriptures on that, so I'm going to try to uh, show you some more things about that uh, concerning Jesus' name being the bread of life, which means that it is what feeds us. It is what nourishes us spiritually as we come to the Lord. That name is a name that brings food, that brings spiritual food uh, into our spiritual being. Last week we talked about a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So Jesus' name incorporates the word of God. Amen. His name is what you find in this book. Je- this book points you to Jesus Christ in every book in it. When you study this Bible, the way you know you're getting the right stuff in it is every time you look in this book, you find Jesus. Now, if you get in this book and you find yourself, you're not looking at it the right way. Because this Bible points you to Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about Christ and it's about His kingdom. It's about what God said He was going to give to Him. And it's about everything that Jesus Christ is and does and operates in. Now today in Psalm 105 verse 15. The Bible says here. Wine that maketh glad the heart of man. And oil to make his face to shine. And what? Bread which strengtheneth man's heart. That's interesting that it's put that way in your Bible. That's in Psalm 104, verse 15. 104.15. If I say 105, I misspoke. 104.15. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man. Now what does wine picture in the Bible? There's a couple of things it pictures. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Wine. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And what else? Wine. Think about it. Wine. (laughs) It represents the blood of Christ, as you just said. Okay? But that wine also represents our communing with the Lord. Okay? And it's a little bit more subtle there, but it's it, it's connected there. Um, when we when we take communion at the communion table, it, it's a picture of our communion with God. Okay, it's a picture here visually of our spiritual communion that we have with God on a regular basis. Now look at that oil. What does that oil represent? His anointing. His anointing, and where does that come from? Two places. Anybody want to take a stab at that? The Word of God and the Holy Ghost. Remember the Bible tells you over there in Acts how God anointed Jesus Christ with what? The Holy Ghost who went about doing good. The Holy Ghost is pictured in the Bible as that anointing oil and that anointing oil comes on the inside of us at the new birth and it makes our face shine before the Lord. Why does that why is that significant? That face shining is a picture of Jesus Christ being on the inside of you because Jesus is the bright and shining face of God. You look at Jesus Christ, you see God. He reveals him The Bible talks about His face. The Bible talks about when you look into the face of Jesus Christ, you see everything there is about God in the eyes, in the face of the Lord. Now, that anointing, the Bible says, abides in you. That anointing comes from the Word of God. Okay? You find that anointing here. Remember, the Holy Ghost never points you outside the Scriptures to reveal anything about God. He always points you back to Jesus Christ, and He always points you to this book here. He'll never speak anything outside the Word of God to you. He'll always reveal it through the Scriptures. Alright, so there's that. Now we get to the bread. That bread. Bread which what? Strengtheneth man's what? 
Remember over there in Romans chapter 10, the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart, it's a heart conversion. It is a heart conversion that starts with the Word of God. The Word of God is the bread of God. Jesus Christ said, This is the bread of heaven that came down. This is the bread of God that came down. Jesus Christ is that bread. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, your heart is strengthened through Him. See? He's that bread. Alright, there's something else. The shoe bread is another type here. And it also points you to Christ and to His words. Go to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus 35. bread. That word shoe. I don't know if you ever noticed it or not. We, we started a series on Wednesday night on the tabernacle. And I'll bring this around here so you can kind of see it. But it's called she bread. And that she bread, S-H-E-W, means to show something. Right there, she bread. Alright, it was put on a table. And when it was put on a table, it was stacked up in six and then six. <laughs> you ever figured out how many books are in your Bible? <laughs> now, how did God... Now, listen. You talk about a supernatural book. God told you before it took place how many books would be in your Bible. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. What did the Catholics say about that? They, they don't say anything. <laughs> they, they ignore it. They have 72 books in theirs. 66. Alright, and they say we're losing, we're missing something. No, we're not missing anything. We've got the right stuff. Amen. Alright, look at over here in Exodus. The Bible says in verse 30, uh, chapter 35, verse 30. Is that what I said? 35, 30? The Bible says here in verse 30, And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord... Am I in the right place here? Hold on a minute. Give me just a minute here. 35, yep. And verse 30. No, I think I wrote the wrong verse down there. Let's see, she bread. It might have been... Is it 13? Yeah, that's how it might be. Yep, there's the shoe bread there. I'm looking for the place where it talks about the shoe bread a little bit more in detail. Give me just a minute here. I wrote the verse down wrong, I think is what I did. My apologies. Anyway, here's the tabernacle in verse um, verse 13. It talks about that shoe bread. The table and his staves and all his vessels and the shoe bread. Now that's interesting that he says the table. Because what does God say about that right there? It's called a table in the New Testament. The table of the Lord. And what's on that table? Bread. And what does that bread point you to? Jesus Christ. What else is on that table? Wine. New wine. Fruit of the vine. What does that point you to? The blood of Christ. See what I'm saying? And that table is also revealing something about God's Word. Go to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus 24. Alright, Leviticus 24 verse 5. Now look at this real carefully. Every detail matters. And thou shalt take fine flour. Verse 5. Leviticus 24 verse 5. This one I, I know I'm right on. <laughs> and thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. Two and ten. Did you notice that? That two and ten there? What is that picture? The 12 tribes. 
There's two southern tribes. There's ten northern tribes. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. They're going to be in one cake. What's that cake represent? Jesus Christ. So that tells you the conversion of the nation of Israel is going to take place at the end where all Israel will be saved, including the northern tribes and the southern tribes in the tribulation period. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row upon the pure table before the Lord. Six and six. Put them two together, you got 66. That's how many books are in your Bible. The Bible says here in the next part, And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, for a memorial, for a memorial. What is this right here? It's a memorial, see? It's a memorial. We're looking back at the death of Christ. The Bible says here, And it shall be for a memorial, and... Um, Thou shalt put, uh, it shall be for a memorial, even an offering made by fire, made by fire unto the Lord. Jesus Christ was set on fire on the cross. And thou shalt, every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Now that's what he said. That's that bread, that's that shoe bread. So it's showing you some things. It's showing you the word of God. It's showing you Jesus Christ. It's showing you what God wants you to do in your local church to remember those two things. So it's pointing to different things. That's why it's called shoe bread. It means to show, Sister Carolyn. That's why they, um, you know, some people say it's show bread. No, it's shoe. Because it's shoeing you something. <laughs> That's a southern term. All right. Now, let's get into the next thing here. Now Jesus Christ's name represents the bridegroom. He's a bridegroom. Go to John chapter 3. He's called the bridegroom. John chapter 3. I was reading on this yesterday. Uh, watching a little bit of that little series just to see what I think about it. I, don't, I ain't made my mind up yet. There's a new series, Bible series called The Chosen. I mean, have you seen any of it? Uh, so far, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's not, you know, they, they've taken some liberties in it, but that's what they always do. But, you know, it's, it's pretty decent so far. Be a good one, to, I think, to watch if you want to watch something religious. John chapter 3, look at verse 29. And he that hath the bride is what? That's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. But the friend of the bridegroom, who's the friend? Does anybody know? You know who the friend is? Who's speaking here? John the Baptist. He's the friend. The friend of the bridegroom, which standeth, at, standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Notice it's John speaking there in verse 27. And then he goes on. He says this. He must increase, but I must decrease. I wish modern preachers would pay attention to that. He must increase, I must decrease. When you get in a pulpit, it should not be about you. It should be about Jesus Christ and increasing Him, exalting Him, glorifying Him, exalting Him, putting him up on the pedestal, putting him on the throne, and debasing yourself. The, yeah. He that cometh from above is above how many people? All. <laughs> that lets you know Jesus Christ is God. The Bible says he that cometh from above is above. He that is of the earth is earthly. There's the Antichrist. And speaketh of the earth. There's the Antichrist. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. You know why? Because you have to be born again to receive the testimony of Jesus Christ. You have to have spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to hear what God is saying. You can't just pick this Bible up and think you're going to figure it out. You're not going to do it. It's a spiritual book and it's spiritually discerned. And I don't care how many years you spend in college or Bible college or university or wherever you want to go to try to figure this Bible out. You're going to come out on the bottom. 
until you're saved. And the Holy Ghost puts light on it. The Bible says here, He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh what? Better, better unline that one. Put a star by it. Highlight it. Circle it. <laughs> he whom God hath sent. Let's talk about the preachers that God has sent. What are they going to do? Speak the words of God. That's how you know the difference between a Bible preacher that God has sent and a hireling that's just out to get your money. A Bible-believing preacher, brother, is going to speak the words of God. He's going to preach and teach the words of God. He's not going to compromise the word to you. He's not going to dance around the tulips and the tithers for you. He's going to speak what God said to speak. And a man that's a hireling that's out just to coochie-coo you, he'll get out there and he'll try to fill out the congregation to see where they are and then he'll preach accordingly. Hello, Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley has changed his whole message to accommodate a whole group of people that God calls an abomination. I think he's a closet queer. Go tell him I said so. Amen. Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son. Baptist. <laughs> and now he's, he's, he's questioning the book of Genesis as being a real, true story. He says that when science says one thing and the Bible says something else, you need to go with science. That came out of his mouth in a pulpit to a congregation of people. That reprobate needs to go home and play golf and stop playing around with church. He really needs to get saved is what he needs to do. Because he ain't saved. Alright. The Bible says here, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son. Therefore you should love the Son. Do you love him? Amen. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. <laughs> Amen. We'll, we'll leave that right there and let that soak for a while. <laughs> the, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I preached this at the prison last night. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, and I don't mean the love, abides on him. Now, I'm going to be preaching that right there scripture next Saturday in street preaching. That's going to be one of my one, two, goes to verses right there. Because I have to let the world know they are not okay, they're not in good condition, and everything ain't right. Because they got in their mind, because they listened to these reprobates on TV, tell them that everything's okay, and God loves them, and everything's fine, and somehow they're going to wind up swooping into heaven... Uh, off their good works and because they're a good person. And we have to get out there and point our finger at them and let them know you're not okay, you're not on the right path, and you're going to hell like a bullet if you don't change your ways. Amen. And you're going to have to get saved to get to heaven. And if you ain't saved, you ain't going. And you've got to come through the door, which is Jesus Christ, and you've got to come through the bridegroom who has the bride. And you've got to be a part of the bride to get in. If you come in outside the bride, you have no wedding garment on, you will not stay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bridegroom. The bridegroom has possession of his bride. Also notice that the bridegroom is identified as he that cometh from above and is above all. Let's go to Psalm chapter 19. He is above all. Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says this. And Job. Psalm 19. Alright, the Bible says in verse 1, The heavens declare what? The glory of God. Do y'all know that the glory of God in the New Testament is identified as a person and that person is Jesus Christ? Alright, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a what? A tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. That's the Lord Jesus Christ showing up at the second advent. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You want some wisdom? Don't pick up Harvard and Yale. You want some wisdom? Pick up a King James Bible and read it. There's your wisdom. It's so far past them that it's, 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 it's hard to even comprehend how far past it is to them. The Bible says the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is what? It's clean. It's not dirty. Let me just uh, park it there for a second, shall we? The fear of the Lord is clean. That means if you're a saved person and you're living right for God, you'll clean up your language. Amen. You won't talk filthy. You can tell if a man's got a clean heart or not by the language he speaks. And if every other word out of your mouth is profanity, I was watching some videos on um, YouTube the other day of churches uh, gone wild or whatever it was called and just watching the filth that's going on in churches today. Preachers in pulpits using profanity right out of the pulpit and justifying it. Saying that I can do this. I can do this. And they're out there shouting and running around and dancing like Michael Jackson and stuff like that. And the filth that's coming out of their mouth would blow your mind. It probably wouldn't blow some of you's mind because you listen to that filth every day. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the fear of the Lord is clean. Clean. See, when I got saved, I lived in a filthy place, spiritually. I lived in a home that was full of filthiness, spiritually. And when I got saved, I wanted to find me a good, clean place to park it. I didn't like living in the hog pen. I wanted to get out of the hog pen and get somewhere, brother, where it was clean, where people were clean, where the language was clean, and you had a clean environment. That's why I looked forward to going to church every opportunity I could get because my parents would not allow me to go to church. I had to lie if you want to know the truth about it and tell them I was going somewhere else. I wound up going to Sister Carolyn's house and telling them that I was going over there just so I could go to church. And we can't get people to go to church uh, that have the freedom and the ability to get there when people out there have a desire and a heart to go and they won't go. It's sad. It's sad. Some, somebody's going to have to give some account for it. I looked forward to going to church. I was like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why? Because there's a clean place that I can go and worship God and get out of the filth that I was living in at home. Amen. You have no idea what kind of a home I lived in. It was profanity 24 hours a day. It was abuse. It was sexual abuse. It was all kinds of stuff. And I'm telling you folks, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, there's plenty more like me that came up through the ranks that are looking for something clean to get into. And there's a lot of people that have the opportunity to stay in that clean place and they refuse to do it. And you're going to have to give an account to God for it. You don't have to answer the preacher. You're going to have to answer to God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea. Does it, does, is, that, is that your heart? Is that where your heart's at? Do you desire that more than gold? Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. See how he's comparing the word of God to these things. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, 
And in keeping of them, there is great reward. When you keep the word of God, there is a reward there that is given to you by Jesus Christ himself. Let me tell you something. Every time you do something for the Lord and you're doing it because you love him, Jesus Christ pays attention to that. And one day you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and God's going to pay you back for it. And boy, that reward's going to be amazing. Amen. Amazing. Yes. Praise God. So don't get weary in well-doing, as Paul said. You may not see no fruit of it down here, but you're not looking down here. You're laying up treasures in heaven where the moth cannot corrupt and the thief cannot break in and steal. The Bible says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. That's a good prayer. You need to pray that every day. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. There's another good prayer. Let, not, let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now you're over in the tribulation period. When the mark of the beast is given. That's the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. My strength and my redeemer. He's your strength and he's your redeemer. There's the bridegroom. Let's keep on reading. Let's go to another one here. Let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Boy, that Psalm 19, boy, it's got a lot of stuff in it. I could spend all day on that one. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of meat in that one. There's some good pork chops and some filet mignon in that one, brother. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> There's some good stuff in that. <laughs> Amen. The Bible says in John chapter 2 verse 1, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, said, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, They have no wine. Now that was a big deal back then. When you had a marriage band, you had people that were preparing those wine pots. You had to calculate how many people were going to be there. And you had to make sure that wine kept being poured. If you ever run out of wine, you in trouble. You, you, your name was mud in the community after that. So the people that were providing the wine had to keep it going. And well, they ran out. So she's trying to cover up for whoever it is that let the wine run out. And she comes to Jesus and knows, knows that he has the power to do something about it. And she tells him, they have no wine. <laughs> Ain't got any. You know what Jesus said to her? He said, woman... Ain't that, something, ain't that something to say to your mama? <laughs> Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's a good thing. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. These beginning the miracles of Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. When Jesus turned that water into wine, the disciples saw that thing and knew what it was picturing. That water goes to wine. You see that thing? And yeah, that's a picture of Calvary. What came out of Jesus' side? Water and wine, buddy. Water and blood. Right out the side. Pew. And what came forth as a result of that water and that blood coming out? The church was spiritually birthed right there. Right there is where the church started. If you really want to know the truth about it. It came out of the side of Jesus Christ. Where did God take Eve out of Adam? Out of his side. Took him right out of here. Pulled it out made a woman, and brought her back to the man. And Jesus Christ on the cross is giving you a picture of what happened in the garden right there on the cross. Because out of that side came water and blood. And your Bible tells you in 1 John, go look at it, 1 John chapter 5. He brings you right back to it. 
Look at verse uh, 8. Chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. There are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, that's the Holy Ghost. And there's that water and the blood. And these three agree in one. It takes those three things to make the new birth. Water, blood, and the Spirit. That Spirit there is the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to be saved. Amen. And that water pictures the Word of God, and you have to have the Word of God to be saved too. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And you've got to have the blood of Jesus Christ, despite what MacArthur said. You've got to have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Amen. And the Bible says uh, that He redeemed us with His blood. Now that's it. That's what happened there on the cross. All right, let's look at another one here. Go to John 14. This time we're going back to the book of John. John 14. John 14, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Now, if you've not watched a movie or a documentary called Before the Wrath, I would encourage you to watch it. Very good movie because it puts some light on both John chapter 2 and John chapter 4 that will give you some insight on some of the things that Jesus said here in their historical settings that kind of gives you light and gives you some good nuggets on, on why Jesus said what he says here. Look at verse 1. The Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now stop right there. In Jewish weddings in Palestine in the 1st and 2nd century and back, when a man wanted to marry a woman, he would go to the father of the bride-to-be and he would ask her hand in marriage. The father would agree based on an agreed dowry. The family would come together and they would agree to a dowry that they would use to basically purchase her for the man. Okay? That's what that dowry was for. All right? It was for the family to take care of them because they were losing her in their entourage. All right? Well, the woman had a say in this matter as well. So what they would do is they would take the woman that the man desired to be with and they would bring her to the gate of the city with the witnesses and the elders and the family members. And the man would say to the woman, after taking a rope and tying around her hand and they would have a cup, he would have a cup there. And he would present that cup to her. And before he presented that cup to her, he would say, I want to marry you. I'm, I'm ad-libbing now. I want to marry you. And what I want to do is let you know, in my father's house, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to prepare this place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you. Now, if you agree to accept this proposal, I have a cup of wine here, and I want you to drink it. Will you drink it? Will you take this cup? Will you partake in this communion with me? And if she received the cup and drank it, the marriage was then betrothed. She became betrothed to the man. He would go and prepare a place for her, and then he would come back and get his bride-to-be and bring her into his father's house. Keep that in mind when you're reading these verses. This is a marriage that Jesus is talking about with his disciples. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Then at the Last Supper... 
After the Passover meal is finished, he presents that cup. He says, you're going to drink it? That's the Lord's Supper. If you receive this cup, you're receiving me. That's what he's saying. And if you take this bread, you're taking me. You're agreeing that you're going to be married to me. Then the Holy Ghost comes in on the day of Pentecost and seals the deal. Amen. Amen. Seals you into the day of redemption and says, you're going home to be with Jesus. No matter what kind of trouble you got going on here, buddy, you're the bride and the bridegroom's coming to get you. Now, thank God for the bridegroom. And when we speak the name Jesus, we're saying he is our bridegroom. All right, let's look at another thing here. Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and look at verse 9. In verse 9, the Bible says this. 22, I think is... Um, 22.9. 22.9. Maybe. Is that it? Let's see if anybody sees that. No, that's not it. I got 21.9 and I don't know why I got that one here. Hold on just a minute. 21.9. No, it's 21.9. I, I had it right. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying... Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious and like, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal." A jasper stone is made up of many different stones and the most precious thing about that thing is when you take on the nature of Jesus Christ, you're taking on something that's most precious in his sight. The new Jerusalem that is described here is where you and I are going to be with the Lord on our honeymoon. Amen. Amen. And it's going to be one of the best honeymoons you've ever seen in your experience. <laughs> it's going to be the greatest thing ever. And because you're going to be with Jesus Christ. And you're going to be in a city that's made of pure gold. <laughs> and the wall of that thing, I was sitting there thinking about that thing yesterday, is 400, between 400 and 450 feet tall. Boy, that's some wall. <laughs> You, that makes Trump go crazy. <laughs> and it's made out of gold. Amen. The city's gold, man. I mean, it's got all kinds. And the thing is 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles that way. I mean, that thing is huge. If you set that thing down on the United States of America, it would take up half the country. That's how big that city is. Plenty of room. Plenty of room. And that's where the bridegroom is right now. He's preparing that place for us. And when he gets that thing just right and gets everything just set up just exactly right, he gets your mansion set up just the way it's supposed to be, he's coming back because he's the bridegroom. And he promised the bride he would take her home to his father's house. See? And that's a, that's a good thing. The bridegroom is identified as the lamb, and the bride, the lamb's wife, is inside a city called the Holy Jerusalem. It's identified in John 14 as the Father's house. And we're going to close right there because we're running out of time here, I think. Let's see where we're we at. We've got one minute. But um, go to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll close right here. This is a good place to close. Because it tells you what the bridegroom is. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5.15. The Bible says in uh, chapter 5, verse 15, it says, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, um, 
Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now go down here to verse 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Now notice that. He's the head. He's not the tail. He don't take a back seat to nobody. He's not a co-pilot. <laughs> you understand what I mean? So if you got a if you got a license plate that says co-pilot, take it off <laughs> and change it. He's your pilot. He's the head. He's the head of this ship. And if you got a woman and a man in a home that's both the head, you got a two-headed monster. Amen. God's got an order. And Jesus Christ said to you, I am your head. He covers you. He's your covering. Ladies, gentlemen, if you're, say, man or woman in this building, he's your head. He's your covering. That's what head means. Headship means he covers you. He protects you. Somebody breaks into your home, man, what are you going to do? I had a man tell me one time, that if somebody breaks into my home, I'm just going to get on my knees and start praying while he's attacking your wife and while he's attacking your children. You're just going to get on your knees and pray? Praying's over, buddy. It's time to put some bullets in the air. <laughs> I mean, if you love your family, you can protect your family. You put a bullet between them eyes. Amen. I mean, you got, you, you're going to sit there and pray? No, you're just being sacrilegious is what you're doing. You ain't going to pray. You're gonna, if, you're, if you're any kind of man at all, you'll protect your wife and your your children. Amen. Praying happens beforehand. But once it goes across that threshold, the praying stops and the action begins. You understand what I mean? And that's the way the Lord sees you. He protects you. Ain't you glad of that? How many times has He protected you and covered you? He's our, he's our, he's our covering, folks. We'll pick up on that next week, and we'll look at some more of that. He's our bridegroom. Thank God for it. Let's close in prayer. Brother Jack, close us in prayer, brother. Thank you, Lord, for the time we get to spend together in your Word. Yes, Lord. We worship you and praise you, O God. We thank you that, that you allow us to worship you in, in, in your book, Father. We just... Thank you for all things and ask God to go with us as we leave this local assembly and watch over and protect each and every one of us and bring us back at next point in time. We praise you and thank you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. All right. Everybody's going to be at the